Dara, how about you give a, a brief introduction about what you do and a little bit about category design and how that helps companies and investors? Okay, you want to you start? Sure. I just started. You just started. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. And I, I can edit this lag out. Great. Okay. So um, let me start by saying uh, how excited I am to spend time with you. Um, I'm really um, Thank you. interested in terms of what Atlas is doing and, and the passion of the team to, to, to have a meaningful community of both startups as well as investors uh, that, that are building and innovating uh, companies um, that ultimately will have an impact in a positive way on the overall environment and, and, and areas such as ESG. Um, by way of background in terms of Daryl, who is Daryl? Um, you know, I, um, I have uh, many scars on the back in terms of the corporate world, uh, was able to uh, run teams regionally or globally, was, was, uh, was CMO of an of a NYSC listed company that got acquired. Um, uh, you know, run, you know, different, uh, teams and, and, um, organizations, um, uh, on the corporate side and decided at a certain point, it was time to hang up the cleats and really go and, and build my own company, which I call out position. And I work very closely with, uh, companies such as play bigger, who have a very hot book out, you should read it. And so I do a lot in the area of strategy into story. Uh, messaging and positioning and uh, category design. And we can kind of go through those things, but that's sort of like a, an evolution of sort of starting very first with helping usually later stage startups really get their strategy into a really clear story, a really compelling, concise, credible uh, point of view, and then ultimately into something called category design. So with category redesign, are there such things as core fundamentals that in category design that companies should adapt as a general rule? Yeah. And yeah, could you elaborate on that? Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, there's a variety of uh, design thinking approaches you can take in terms of strategy and in terms of scaling and growth uh, and Category design is a unique approach to that that does have a set of components which we believe are immutable in terms of that you need to really go and do if you're going to ultimately um, have strategic intent to be the category leader and emerge as the category leader. Um, first of all is an exploration of the problem that you were solving today and into the future. That may sound sort of trite, but it tends to be one of the most difficult steps within the entire design thinking process to really have a management team uh, sit down and be able to crisply say what that problem is and not lead with the problem, not lead with the company. Uh, and to speak from a more, if, if you will, generic sense in terms of that, that problem that will resonate with an audience and how that problem evolves into the future. From that key step, we then start to go into the actual point of view. And usually this is something that first emerges as a 600 to 800 word uh, encapsulation of that, of that story, of that point of view, leading with the problem, describing it, making it visceral, uh, then into the solution and how that solution plays. And then you end with the company and its unique uh, capabilities, et cetera. From there, you're also including the category name. Uh, we are wired for categories. So Jet or Daryl, when we were born and came into the world, we had two things. Uh, we had concept and we had category. So hungry, uh, not hungry, uh, unhappy, happy, it goes into category. So we that's are- That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. That's the, exactly. And it's, and it's why when you go into a supermarket, it's not alphabetical. It's organized around categories because deep within us, that's how we organize and sort and sift. And it's never been more critical than today because there's so much noise. There are so many brand messages. There are so, so many media platforms. There's so much going on 
We are continually sifting and creating categories and we're deleting categories. We don't care about DVD and Blu-ray or what's the best machine to buy. I don't care. It's moved on in terms of my overall cloud subscription for entertainment and content. So we live and breathe around categories day to day. So we've gone from problem to point of view to naming the category. The next two steps then are sort of in young, if you will, two sides of the coin. One is you need to show as a company, as a startup, what is your strategic intent to dominate this category with your own build out of your solution. Most companies sort of show this in waves, sort of first wave, two waves, maybe six, 12 months, maybe, maybe they're in 12 months, so 12, 24, 36, right? And, and it really forces the team and aligns the team as part of this process to be clear on what needs to be delivered and when. And it also shows investors or analysts or media or maybe high level customers, what are you gonna build and deliver on in the future as well? And when you do that, you lay claim to it. You're already putting your stake in the sand before somebody else does. And so, look, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. I probably shouldn't say that on this it's kind of a forum, um, but you know, I have, to res I have to respect Zuckerberg's blueprint. If you look at what their blueprint is, you know, out in the future, they're going to disintermediate telecommunications players and have direct laser communications. So they have a very clear blueprint and clear path on why they're gonna remain dominant in the category that in many ways they have, they have defined. Um, the other side of the sort of yin-yang is ecosystem because you cannot be a uh, category by yourself. You need to show your independence of thinking that the category is bigger than you that you have strategic intent to be the leader, the thought leader, and to dominate in terms of delivering on a, on a solution around that problem, but you are one slice of the pizza. So there's other parts, there's government and regulatory, there are, there are channel partners, there's adjacent technologies, there are key analysts, both on the financial and uh, trade and, and, and technology side, there are media, there are, there are a variety of things that go into this overall ecosystem map. And the ecosystem map shows your independence of thinking. Very powerful for investors. Very powerful to show to key analysts. Um, it, it showed, and very, very powerful to actually to, to, to go and engage with your channels and alliances. So we've done problem, point of view, category name. We're now doing uh, blueprint and ecosystem, which actually play off of each other quite well. Now you're into something around um, mobilization, training and enablement to make your team as viral as possible, including your, your uh, channel, channel partners potentially, the ability to deliver in their own words on that point of view. And you're into something now in terms of go-to market, the actual execution, which we call lightning strike. So this final component of this design thinking process is lightning strike. It is a concentration of act activity. Boom, lightning strike that cuts through the noise for like two weeks, for example. It's not peanut butter. You're not, you're not spreading out your investments for marketing and your channel and enabling activities and your, you know, your, your different investments. You're having a very mindful concentration of activity where you actually do get cut through uh, for, for a couple of weeks, probably. And you probably do that like twice a year and um, you, you lead with your point of view. So your point of view is actually part of your, of your uh, most, um, you know, it's the most lethal part of your weapon set in terms of, of your lightning strike. That from tip to tail, I know that's a very long answer, um, but that tip to tail is the entire design thinking process that is called category design. Daryl, this is, excellent stuff you know you laid out the foundation of what category design is um for people who are would are new to this are you able to put context around the steps that you just outlined by let's say are you able to give an example of let's say a company that you've advised mm -hmm. and how they've gone through this journey and you talk about what they identified, how they've executed and throughout these steps, just to, to be able to internalize this, this, these principles a bit better. 
Absolutely, no, that is very fair. And so, uh, but somewhat shamelessly, let me also say, you know, read the book, uh, Play Bigger. So we work very closely with the Play Bigger crew. They're, they're our dear brothers, lots of, lots of great stories. You wrote this. I did not write this. Oh. I, 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 I'm in the book, uh, you will find, find me in here. I worked at the companies, Mercury Interactive, Science in here, et cetera. Worked very closely with Chris Lockhead, worked very closely with uh, Dave Peterson. Know that these are my adopted brothers. So I, you know, I'm based in Singapore. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with the Play Bigger group, uh, especially for the Asia Pacific uh, group, um, uh, region, sorry. So read the book, uh, you'll get incredible context. It is a, you know, it's one of the hottest business books out there right now. So why wouldn't you? Play Bigger, okay, got it. You know, how, go read Play Bigger, how, how, how rebels, innovators design and dominate markets. So you can just do that. And there's, there's podcasts and you can ping me as well. And I'll send you a document that has all sorts of links in it. In terms of some interesting clients, I'll, I'll do some recent stuff probably. Um, we were talking about ecosystem, ecosystem uh, recently. Um, it, was, it was really interesting for me to um, reconnect and have a discussion with uh, the CEO at a company called High Pages. Uh, they IPO'd at the end of uh, 2020 uh, and uh, uh, are, are one of the hottest uh, growth companies in Australia right now. And it was really interesting in terms of their journey around category design and how um, they really took something, uh, uh, an area that had that that is seven percent of say the Australian economy in terms of uh, home renovation, home improvement, home repair, and had never really been captured and really wrestled into uh, a set of efficiencies around the entire process of how you engage with the tradesperson or tradey, as you say in Australia. Um, and, and to, to then define the on-demand trade economy and to have a great point of view and to ultimately three years later to, to IPO and for things such as the ecosystem map to interestingly look at the perspective and, and realize that that ecosystem map evolved over time. It started and looked one way. And then over time, as more and more information and knowledge and perspective came in, that that visual of what is the ecosystem uh, for the on-demand trade economy evolved uh, and is, was used in the prospectus and is now what they, they put in front of, of folks such as especially uh, channel partners and is very, very powerful. So uh, that's so, an interesting- So um, are you able to, let's say, break down as an example for us, what the, this company that you just talked about, what is their category problem? What is their peer POV? What is their blueprint? What is their ecosystem? Blah, blah, blah like all that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, do you want me to do that now? Or, but that, that's part of what that, I mean, the design thinking process is, is, is those set of things all the way into things such as the lightning strike, which um, people go, oh, do I have to go spend a lot of money on the lightning strike? I'll just give you an example. Uh, yeah, with the High Pages Group, um, where their first lightning strike, they wanted to have uh, research and data, uh, and so this did not exist. So we, you know, helped work on the the actual survey instrument, um, and the data came back, and they partnered with uh, uh, Ernst Young and, and and a government agency, and they created, and they had, you know, fresh content, which was fantastic, pre fresh data that had never been captured before. And so great PR, um, but they also did some guerrilla marketing where they went and hung signs up at construction sites in, in metropolitan areas such as Sydney that just seemed to like go on forever. Like <laughs> that, that, that construction site is there forever. You're sitting in your car, you're slowly going by it, you know, like you've been, you know, you've seen this construction site for a year and a half and it slows every time because, of, because it's there, right? In terms of traffic. And they hung signs up that said, need a little help with that job mate and they stayed up there for months and months and months nobody took them down it was kind of tongue-in-cheek and it's prime real estate like it and it was free there was guerrilla marketing um we've done stuff with clients you know rsa for example is the biggest cybersecurity uh conference that happens the twice now we have done stuff where RSA had to go and change the actual guidelines and regulations for the show because we went and did something that dominated 
um, and 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 um, had to then change change the the regulations so you couldn't go and do that again. Um, but the client was incredibly happy because they were able to go and do something that they cut through, and and it's those sort of examples I think that I'm excited to talk about because there's a practicality and a, a tangible set of outcomes if you really take on category design. It's not. It's not this, you know, when I describe it, I hope it doesn't sound like it's a huge number of steps, but it does actually deliver on the goods. It, if you really embrace it and, and you know, you, know you, you can do it yourself if you think you're capable, uh, read the book um, and, 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 and think about it as a process, but it really does work. And so, yeah, at any time anybody wants different examples, um, very excited to talk about those. So could you walk us through the steps of, um, so the example of the company that you advised just now, um, so what was their problem that they identified? How did they structure their PO point of view? What was their um, blueprint and what was their um, ecosystem? Sure. Just so break down I mean, those steps. Yeah, I mean, because I'm talking to, 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 to Atlas and I'm talking to Jet um, that, that I, you know, probably we should talk about a, a ESG related company. Um, not to say that that's the only thing you guys will ever do, but there is obviously an orientation around Atlas. Uh, in okay. This space. So um, uh, let me let me probably talk about like clean earth technology. So this is a company which is a hybrid between Southeast Asia and Australia. Headquarters is now in in Singapore. So you can look up clean earth tech. Um, the origins very much in Western Australia, uh, obviously WA went through an amazing uh, black swan event with a lot of uh, money coming in from China, buying commodities, et cetera, and, and mining activity. And some folks really thought about, well, what's next? And what, what, can, we, what can we go and do? Um, and so some very strong historical linkages to the mining industry um, but there was a realization that there are amazing innovations and technologies out there that, that are really not brought to, to market effectively. They're not commercialized and potentially never used. And it's unfortunate because the fact is that we, you know, that we need to, to avail ourselves of the richness of the earth, right? Whether it's agriculture or whether it's, you know, if you think about gold, for example, um, it's used in our electronics. Um, it's used as a store of value. It's used for aesthetics. It doesn't go away. And so, but is there a way that we can, um, uh, you know, uh, tap the richness of the earth, but do it in a much more benign, gentle uh, way? And so that was really the, the, the core concept at the, at the outset for clean earth technologies. And um, they have now licensed technology from Flinders University uh, in, in, in Australia, and it is um, used cooking oil, canola oil, from all sorts of sources, of course, fast food places, et cetera. And it's inverse vulcanized and turned into a dry powder, a polymer. And that polymer now is being used as a couple of examples in um, the mining of gold, where you don't use nasty stuff like mercury or cyanide, it, it is this carbon-based inert product which bonds with the gold, and you're able to pull it out. And so you have a, you're able to process the gold, but it's in a much more gentle, natural way. And uh, they're they're now testing it and, and have um, significant trials in Queensland where it's coating um, fertilizer. And then you don't have the runoff into the waterways and you don't get the algae bloom that gets all the way to the, to the ultimately to the, to the Great Barrier Reef, et cetera, because you're coating the fertilizer again in this carbon-based polymer and it lasts longer, you use less fertilizer, et cetera. So those are just two examples of doing other things. But the journey for them as, as folks who, you know, not in the ESG uh, space are now, they're on this journey and defining this category around clean earth technologies and around clean earth exchange, where they're able to identify technologies and innovations that can be commercialized and made a reality. Because if you don't bring those two things together, nothing happens, right? You still have 
you know, you still have algae bloom or you still have like not you know, you know, toxic chemicals being used for say gold mining, et cetera. They're now actually underway in a, in a big way in, in e-waste as well, replacing uh, some of the nasty stuff that's used to wash uh, the, the, the electronic boards and, and pull up the, the, um, the, the, the metals. And so replace it again with a, a much more gentle, benign uh, substance. And, and this particular product um, uh, just won the Prime Minister's Award for Innovation in, in Australia just about six months ago. So their journey from two and a half years ago to from being very much a practical sort of industry focused set of folks to now doing stuff in the ESG space and they hope to, to list uh, at some point in the near future is, is a journey that we've been part of and helping them craft that, that story around this gap of great technologies and innovations that are not being partnered with people, resources, capabilities that are able to commercialize them where these things are uh, working with them around their blueprint, around the ecosystem. And the ecosystem is quite interesting when you look at theirs because it's got the mining industry, it's got agriculture, it's got e-waste. It's also being used in uh, maritime uh, response where the, this, it's turned into floating bricks that actually um, pick up oil from an oil spill. Again, the same polymer substance, right? Um, and so, um, you know those those are their, their core assets when they're when they're going out and presenting who they are uh, and and they've they've uh, they've run very very consistently uh, a lightning strike. You can go and see what they've done in terms of uh, not a lot of investment actually in Facebook, but I think they've got something like ninety thousand followers or something like that just because of the strength of the of the of the point of view and and the content that they put out. Um, and so that that's a that's more of an ESG example, more in the region and one word. What would you say is the gist of their message and point of view? If you could really distill it in like a sentence or two, that's easily conveyed to um, people that come across it. When you, when you go there, you, when, you, when you experience the brand and they go to the website, you see that, um, that, that there is this richness of the earth that we can, um, that we can tap, but we can do it in a more gentle, benign way. And there needs to be this transparent uh, exchange of technologies and commercialization to make that a reality. Um, and so, you know, that problem of stuff that's great in the laboratory and people in sort of, you know, white spots and doing great stuff and, and not getting it out and into the market and, and commercialized and tr truly making an impact that's a big problem. That's a massive problem of great technology, great innovation, but it's not being commercialized and brought to market. And there needs to be a much more transparent exchange and visibility that brings those things together. Okay. Um, I know, I know we've only have a few minutes left and I, I really want to respect your time. Um, I think I'm just going to outline, uh, I think, two more questions that I'm going to ask and then see how long you're able to do this. So the first question I'm going to go into is like, um, would you say, the first one is, would you say if, if companies adhere to principles of category design, is that a recipe for success? And the second question is, how can in general investors know that this company is um, on the right path of identifying a problem and articulating it and solving it. So those are the, the, the two questions are, are asked. Or would you be able to have time to address those? Sure, let's, and, and, uh, so I'll try to make it a little shorter too. Um, your first one, recipe for success, right? Yeah, so uh, the question is, um, it, I, I so- this, I got yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, if, so uh, do you think that companies that are, are successfully implementing these principles for category design, would that be a recipe for success um, as a default or, it, or is it not that simple? It, I mean, it's, it, there's, there's a lot of variables in, in, in terms of any company, any market, any, but um, the, the answer 
it categorically, pardon the pun, is, is yes, it will improve your, your, your chances of success. Think about in terms of you say recipe uh, or equation, think about product design, company design, category design. Most startups, most companies think about product design. And if you don't have a great product, if it's a crap product, you, you're not gonna be very successful. So product design, absolutely key um, as part of the equation. Company design, do we have the right people? Do we have the right skill sets? Are we scaling? Are we going in the right direction? Obviously critical for success. The, 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 the component uh, um, part of the recipe that often is overlooked is the category design. What category are we mindfully designing and, and, and have a strategic intent to dominate? What is our point of view? What is, what is the problem, bigger problem? And how are we articulating that? In terms of that, the, a simplification to your, you know, in terms of your answer to your question is, those would be the three components that I think you should consider in terms of if we do those three or chances of probability of success are higher. Got it. Second part in terms of the investors. I think if we take what we've discussed today and we say, look, look for the companies who are, who are not leading with the problem, not leading with, we've done this before, we're a great team, we're like, you know, we're serial entrepreneurs that we have done this and that. You know, we see this, you know, you see certain terminology used over and over again. Look for the companies and the teams who are talking clearly about a problem and about that solution. And do they make a customer the hero of the story before they talk about themselves? And as they, as they do that and as they describe that, that problem, are they talking about the potential for new economics? Not just total addressable market today, but the adjacent possible. So the adjacent possible and how that curve gets pushed out and there's a new section of economics that come in that are going to be a catalyst for the overall valuation and driver uh, for that company. Those are the two sort of components I hopefully close with and hopefully were reasonably clear for you. All right, that's great. This is really good stuff, Daryl. Thank you. And how could one learn more about this? You mentioned the book. Uh, could you... Um, if you could uh, plug the book again, and then maybe some online links on how to learn more about you or websites on, on, on category design. So look, I named my company uh, Out Position because I'm Canadian and I get to say the word out all the time. So if you go to out-position, uh, you'll see that .com that, that you know, we're very, very passionate around category uh, and, and this design thinking process. So you can go there um, and there are different links, et cetera. Uh, you can always reach out to me uh, and uh, we have a ton of different um, uh, links and, and podcasts and different things that you can sort of, uh, you know, look at while you're on the treadmill, et cetera. Um, read the book, play bigger, um, uh, go to, go to out position or, or try to, try to, try to track me down on LinkedIn um, and, and I'd love to follow up.